All right, Kevin, I'll let you get us started here. Thank you, Dennis. I'd like to begin by saying uh, the land I'm standing on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the Nishnawabek, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wandat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, um, Intuit, and Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Thank you, everyone. My name is Kevin Dawson. I'm president and CEO of ISA Cybersecurity. Uh, joining me is Dennis. Dennis, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, great. Thanks, Kevin. Good to be with everyone today. Dennis Ryan, I'm the senior director in our advanced technology team, uh, looked after, after a specific product that deals with email authentication and look forward to chatting today about our topic of BEC or business email compromise and risks in the supply chain. So yeah, Kevin, probably be a good idea, you know, it seems like we always get into acronym soup, right? So why don't we, we kind of know what BEC is now, we can see on the screen business email compromise, some other terms we may throw around just so people are familiar with it, uh, EAC or email account compromise. And what often happens there is, you know, somebody unsuspecting engages in a malicious email uh, exchange and then the compromise occurs, right? And then the game is afoot. The bad actor has, has got what they want. They want to then be able to move lateral within an organization. They've got some way into an organization. Um, any other acronyms you see us throwing around here today we want to get through up front? Uh, well, there's, there's IR, which is instant response. So we'll have to we might throw out IR and instant response. Uh, DEFER is a term that I may end up using, which is digital forensics and instant response. Um, those are a couple other ones that, that may fly around that people may not be familiar with. So I think those are the, the key ones. Okay, great. Well, we're going to go through for the folks who are watching this, I uh, do appreciate your time. We're going to go through some slides that will really guide the discussion. This isn't going to be a, a death by PowerPoint or anything here that we're just focusing on one specific tech. We're really talking about what happens in an event where business email compromise occurs. And a lot of times we see this beginning, and I'll just start off here, Kevin, I'll have you jump in, is we see uh, at Proofpoint, a lot of these begin with email because it's really, it's the cheapest, it's the number one threat vector. We see it in the Verizon data breach reports. We hear about it all the time is, it's just simple to spoof or impersonate, right? I identity deception is out there. You can do that by impersonating the actual domain of an organization. You may create lookalike domains. Um, people are using third-party senders to act on their behalf. So sometimes if you don't know who your third-party senders are, uh, you know, you got a number of different folks that are sending as you. Uh, and then we'll get down into the supply chain in a moment. But those are, those are the most prevalent is really that domain impersonation and a lookalike domain. And, and one of the things we see a lot of times, Kevin, I don't know about your team there, but we see if an organization within that supply chain has been compromised, the bad actors are really patient and they will watch good email go back and forth and they'll wait for the right time. And the right time is when there's a transaction that's about to occur, uh, then they can create a lookalike domain of that supply chain partner, and they'll actually copy in the whole thread of all the legitimate activity, hoping that somebody doesn't catch that little nuance, right? The one little letter that changes in that lookalike domain and get them to then send a payment somewhere else. Yeah, we're, we're seeing, I mean, our, 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 the acronym I defined before, DEFER, Digital Forensics Instant Response. It's a big part of our organization. It's a team we have. Um, think of it as kind of the green beret that come in when there's when there's an incident, and uh, and we're on call with many customers that, that have us on retainer for that. And I would say the majority or a good portion of the calls that we get are in this area. A uh, number of kind of example cases we can go through. Uh, it's interesting because the the same tactics that we're talking about today that that uh, your technology uh, we leverage and and their customers leverage to help. Um, prevent these things, it's the same tactics that we use uh, when we're helping to kind of build security awareness for customers. And, and we do the things like build lookalike domains and, and 
if, you're, if your company domain has an M in it, it's very easy to do an R and an N and it looks like an M and people fall for that. And then they click on the email, they click on the domain. Um, logos, um, the, the, the Verizon attack uh, of last week, um, the, the, it started with a, a campaign by email and they use the little symbol for checkbox, like check, the, sorry, the uh, square root uh, to replicate the Verizon logo. And people uh -huh. don't see that it just looks like a V. So um, we're seeing a lot of it. We've, uh, uh, we, we recently had a case where an attacker used a previously leaked data from a compromised site. And that, that's, the, that's the other side of this equation on, on kind of email account, I mean, email account compromises or business email compromises is when people use the same passwords and same authentication for their corporate email as they do for the private email as they do for other login sites and retails, one of those organizations gets breached and then the, the would-be hackers use that breach information to try to compromise other sites and compromise those users on their corporate platforms because they have a fundamental understanding of where the company, where the person might work from their uh, mm -hmm. the email that they have compromised or from LinkedIn and things like that. Um, we had one where a, a, a user's data was previously leaked um, in, a, in another complete um, um, separate uh, data leakage. And they used that data to compromise a user that was in the process of going through an M&A. Mm -hmm. And uh, the attacker inserted themselves into that email thread and that email chain by kind of adding a similar looking um, uh, lookalike domain and so that nobody else really noticed. Uh, they were then able to get all future emails pertaining to that M&A up to and leading to electronics funds transfer emails. Uh, they then attempted to remove the finance person and send a correction email to the finance person with a new account number for electric funds transfer. So it's not always about business email compromise and then a follow-up ransom or things like that. It's oftentimes to inject in. Um, at this point in time, we were engaged by this client in an IR, and, uh, and we were able to stop it. Um, we'd been engaged kind of when the, the compromised user was sent another email to somebody else in the organization that coincidentally, that user was speaking to the person on the phone at the exact same time. And they said, yeah, I didn't send that email. And that's kind yeah. of for this client what raised those alarm bells. Uh, and that's when we were first involved. But these compromises don't always just resolve in. And, and as you said, there's sometimes um, a slow play to them. It's not, I compromised the email an hour ago and now I'm now I'm doing something. I may be in there for a while or the, the would-be hacker may be in there for a while before they figure out what they want or how they can exploit it. Oh yeah, they're, they're looking for those valuable access to the cloud accounts, right? They want to find out who's got privileged access. And when they can see that and then they can download something to that machine, get those passwords, you know, you're, and we're talking, you know, different technology can look at this, but, you know, organizations needing the multi-factor authentication coupled with, you know, who's accessing the cloud account. So you need that CASB or service broker, cloud account service broker, because somebody shouldn't be accessing critical information in Toronto at noon and two hours later, they're accessing it in Singapore. Well, that's, that should send off alarm bells really fast. And uh, like you say, from incident response, I'm sure you'll get folks that uh, you'll see those accounts that have been compromised and they're probably patient. They're probably getting into Outlook calendars and looking at who's meeting with who and what vendors they're meeting with. And they know who to target, don't they? They, they sit back, the reconnaissance is really good. Yeah, 100%. We, 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 the one you referred to, we call the Superman rule, and we actually have it in our SOC service because we run a 7 by 24 365 managed service uh, monitoring customers' environments, including their cloud environments. And when we see a geolocation tag of, of Toronto, for example, and a, a corresponding geolocation tab, tag in within 30 minutes, an hour, whatever, somewhere around the world, um, Superman is the only one that can get between those two places so quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. our it's what we call our Superman role, and uh, so that's that's also an important piece in in kind of uh, forensically investigating these types of of compromises is being able to look at um, the logging of the of the environments. And with the proliferation of things like Office three sixty five or Google Cloud, 
Um, people need to understand it's not just the email inbox that that now user now has access to because your authentic authentication goes across the board. If you're using SharePoint in the cloud, now your SharePoint infrastructure, if you're using OneDrive, now that user has access to all your OneDrive and, and it goes beyond just, uh, again, the, the, the one email box they might be able to send emails on. Yep, yeah, and that's where uh, Proofpoint uh, through a number of really important strategic acquisitions that we pulled up is moving with that concept of the zero trust network and knowing, okay, where's data going? Is it, are, are we losing that? So DOP capability, data loss prevention capability to understand what data is being exfiltrated, but then we want to move it up the chain. I think it complements things that ISA does, and that is who are the people being targeted? So then if we can get into information protection based on the persona or the person who's got the privileged access because the data doesn't just walk out the door, right? Either somebody's being malicious in, in their intent, they might be leaving the organization. We've seen recently, oh, vaccine mandate, I'm not gonna get the vaccine to heck with you, I'm gonna pull data because I'm mad at you, you're making me lose my job. Whoa, that, that's a frightening prospect. So data walks out the door maliciously by accident, Hey, I'm meaning to do the right things. Pandemic, I'm gonna forward stuff to my Gmail account so I can work on it at home. Well, wait a minute, that's sensitive data. You shouldn't be doing that. Or the third, and that's what you deal with, you come in is what happened? Something data leaked, we, we lost this stuff and we gotta figure out where the compromised accounts are and how do we, how do we stop the bleeding there? Yeah, and, 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 and as you said, phishing is still the number one vector for these things. Um, and, and it's a, a um, major portion of the work that we do, both in, as I said, the reactive work and coming in and, and helping the customers contain these types of situations um, and investigate and, and, and do all the forensics, but as well as in our ongoing services, but, but also in our awareness. I, I think we, we recently did a survey as an organization and, and surveyed a bunch of companies in, in Canada, um, almost a thousand. And it, it appears as if that a majority of, of corporate users um, still are not, don't feel that their organization is, is providing enough awareness on, on these mm -hmm. types of threats. Um, because the threat actors out there, there's a lot of information available. If you have recruiting efforts through an HR type system or, or platform, uh, because it's external in recruiting, people will know that. So if you're using something like Bamboo as an example, as an HR platform, and you're recruiting via that, would-be hackers are gonna know that. So they're gonna exploit that when they send phishing emails and say, hey, you need to update your vacation request. And they're gonna make it look like a Bamboo email. And a lot of companies and a lot of individuals will kind of fall victim to that because, oh yeah, we're using that product. That makes sense. I understand why this email is coming through to me. Supply chain's no different. You'll have vendors and suppliers and, and oftentimes, through awards and contracts and, and the RFP process. And this company was successful in winning this bid with this organization. Mm -hmm. Well, the would-be hackers will now represent that they're the uh, winner and, and go into the supply chain and say, hey, we need to have payment redirected here for our recent contract. And that's how they're successful. So there's, it's not just individuals and people being exploited by their social media accounts and things. It's corporations by the, in, by the information that they have to publish by the nature of, of, of digital business today. Yeah, absolutely. I was just chatting with Ohio State University during the Cybersecurity Awareness Month. They ran a, a program um, trying to just bring more awareness to phishing activity and what could happen, especially for the fellows and the, you know, the PhDs that are writing very important papers that get them grants and get them money in the door. And I just went to the Ohio State website saw who received a couple of grants recently, created a fake email and said, uh, great work, you'll need to send your paper here. And then also we'll need to route that payment, you know, to the new Ohio State, you know, ID, et cetera. And just made, you know, just mocked something up. But I asked people, how does that look? You know, and, and they all said, that's dead on because it was everything right out of the article. All I had to do was five minutes of reading and it was right there to who received it how much it was for, what the topic was, everything was right there to, to, to see it. So yeah, security awareness is critical. It's something that we invested in when we acquired an organization called Wombat about three years ago. And uh, we've been able to link that security awareness training in so that that last line of defense, the people 
when they click on a button that says, you know, this is an alarm here. I'm going to, I'm going to sound the alarm. This doesn't sound right. Then they may prevent an issue cascading across the organization. Then the security team has something to look at. They can also in turn see who else got that email. Who's being targeted by this threat actor? Was it just one person in the organization or more? And then let's go pull those emails out of the mailbox. Yeah, and, I, and I'm going to talk about kind of the last year and a half and, and the increase we've seen in kind of phishing and business email compromises, um, both from the standpoint of, of, of um, again, using previously uh, disclosed credentials in a previous uh, uh, leak somewhere or data leakage, as well as kind of users falling victim to phishing. The reason it's one of the reasons it's going up so much is the work from home. And I'm not going to advocate one way or the other whether people should be in an office or not. But uh, there's no denying that in, in prior to COVID and, and prior to the situation, if you were sitting beside a colleague or in the same office as a colleague and you saw something that looked weird, you could just shout, shout across the cubicles or, or go see them and say, hey, I got this email from you looking for this data, but, but I, I, why are you asking for this? And it was a lot easier to socialize what would be a phishing attempt in the office setting. Today, everyone at home, uh, they don't have time to set up a, a, a Zoom meeting to say, "Hey, did you send this meeting?" And it's it's a little less dis it's a little more disconnected, and so we're seeing that, and that, that's part of the reason uh, in our in our perspective and from the volume of, of of opportunities, both preventative that we see in our our managed service that we stop, as well as the ones that with customers with retainers where they engage us in a, in a digital forensics perspective. Um, it's the majority of what we're seeing out there is, is these compromises because people are just disconnected from their colleagues uh, more than they were before and, and falling victim for these emails that look like they're coming from somebody else in a legitimate fashion. Yeah, we've heard the same. It's, you know, people have now all of a sudden a, a child still at home. There's a distraction. Somebody's coming to the door, the dog barking, you know, how many Zoom calls have been on when the dog's barking, right? Uh, there's, there's that stress of what's going on there at the house. And you talk about a colleague, also that IT support team. They're not right there around the corner to just say, hey, Bob and IT, you know, I'm, I've been getting some of these odd emails or it appears odd. Can you take a look, right? If they're working from home, that's, that's not something that they pick up on. So um, we'll move forward on a couple of things here. So we've, I think we've defined BEC really well, gave a number of examples there of, of how we've seen that uh, hit in the wild and how we've seen bad actors used a variety of tactics uh, from a technology perspective. There are different things organizations can do. I'll talk through just a few things here. Domain spoofing, just doing a direct domain spoof. Whoop. You can actually prevent that in your organization, another acronym, DMARC. Um, and that is taking, so this, this domain messaging authentication that I'm talking about, reporting and conformance, DMARC has been around for a long time. It's a standard that basically retrofits email. Uh, people think that there's nothing they can really do about it. Well, there is, and it's being widely adopted. And I'm gonna show you some of the, you know, some of the folks that have been doing that, especially here in Canada, like RBC. Uh, but you can actually lock that down. Then we use techniques like machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence gets thrown around, but it really is important because there's a distinction in the two and being able to understand the heuristics of have I been getting email from this person as a supply chain partner, but now all of a sudden it's from the appears to be same person, but it's originating in a totally different country. We need to learn those anomalies so that we can catch those attempts. And they typically do things like a lookalike domain or a display name spoof. A display name spoof could be, you know, the CEO's name, but a Gmail address and bad actor trying to act like them. And we, we kind of talked about email account compromise. So just make sure we're all clear on the definitions. And then I'll have you talk to this. I mean, there's, there's no shortage of headlines, right? There's, we see the ransomware hit, we see disruption within the supply chain, we see disruption in an organization that they get held hostage. And some of these, they can't even get cyber insurance these days, or their rates are going to go up uh, a tremendous amount. Maybe we should talk a little bit about that of having a good security posture to show your cyber insurance provider, but I'll let you, you know, take a couple of different directions on this and the, and the headlines. Well, yeah, and, and again, um, I can talk uh, to, to uh, 
nauseum about the number of scenarios and the things that come in. And, and when we see every week, um, obviously can't talk about any specific customers that we might have been involved in. Um, but sometimes, and, and in the notion of ransomware, uh, people often think ransomware is some encryption software that's been put on their computer and everything is encrypted. Sometimes the ransom is, is not encryption at all. It's, I have your data, and unless you want it publicized, um, you're going to pay a ransom. Or it could be in the case of one customer where they, they were, say, I guess, fell victim to a, um, a phishing attempt, a phishing email. And the, the uh, would-be or hacker um, appeared to see what he thought was sensitive data in their mailbox and proceeded to download all the data, download all the emails, and then delete all the emails and delete all the information in their inbox. And mm. then followed with a ransom note to the general email address of the organization, the company, um, with a sample, with a sample of one of the emails was downloaded and indicating that unless a ransom was paid, that they would disclose the emails and that you would not get them back. And so that wasn't an encryption. It wasn't one of the, the traditional things. And it was at this point that we were engaged with the client. Um, we kind of first disabled the account and, and, and investigating the sensitive emails. And with the assistance of, of Microsoft, we were able to recover most of the emails that the, the, the attacker had perceived to be sensitive. And, and, and some of them were not. Some of them were not sensitive that he had. Uh, and the, the organization was safely able to ignore the ransom note and, and subsequent ones. Um, and then we continued to monitor uh, the dark web uh, as, a, as a service we have for 70 days to see if the data was published. And, uh, and we saw no sign of it and continued to talk to the client uh, through that time and provide them lessons learned on strengthening their defense and other things. And one of the things I, I would like to bring highlight to at this point in time is, is when we get involved, it's, it's largely because somebody has had the courage to step up and say, hey, I think I made a mistake or something happened here. And there is a lot of, in the industry, um, I'm going to say shame that goes along with uh, acknowledging that you uh, that you were, fell victim, and it can happen to anyone. And so, one of my my I guess words of advice to to the audience in, in this panel and, and supply chain side is is encourage your people and your teams to come forward with these things because it's it's only through that um, that one you'll you'll be able to react quicker because if time goes on, it becomes more problematic, and two we have to take out the stigma and shame of, of people falling victim to this because without the stigma and shame, then the people are going to be more willing to learn and educate and, and build off of the experiences of each other. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, Kevin. I think an organization that informs their people about a plan that they have, then they talk about, we do have an incident response plan. We do have things in place, uh, but you are our last line of defense and we need you to be vigilant and we're going to train you, you know, so that you know how you're being targeted, uh, which is the stance we really advocate and stand behind is that, that people centric view of, you know, who are the most valuable assets in the organization because of what they've got access to and how are they being targeted? I mean, one point, a proof point, it was really funny. A field SE was the most attacked person in our organization. It wasn't our CEO or CFO or, you know, or a VP title. It was this SE because he was doing such an awesome job on the public forums and talking about all the great things that we're doing. And they assume he's probably got some pretty good privileged access to be able to talk about some of the things he's, he's talking about and their customers, et cetera, they wanted to get through and access his account, right? So that's where you gotta know, are, are we being targeted by people that are keystroke loggers or what, you know, what is it and, and, and how are we being targeted so that we can train the people so that we don't make these headlines. Uh, and then, you know, that people feel like they have been, you know, shown shown the way to spot some of this, especially if they're told, this is how you're specifically being targeted. You're fortunate, we've been able to block this, we've got a great gateway or other tech around this, but this is how they're trying to target you. So we wanna make sure you know what you know what you might get if something does get through, very important. Yeah, and, 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 and kind of specific to this audience in the supply chain, I, I wanted to bring up the fact that Oftentimes, these business email compromises or, or attack attempts to, to get some sort of both 
account access or privilege access are really not at the target that's exploited, but at their customers. So we're seeing a lot more of, of that happening in the industry where people are being attacked because they're a supply chain to somebody else, because they're part of uh, a supply stream to organizations. First, uh, providers of certain medical equipment are being attacked today to get to the hospitals and, and get, because they're a supply chain change to the hospitals and they're, it's easier to kind of, as, as you put before, replicate and or uh, pretend to be that supply chain to a hospital externally. Um, one, you expect the email to come in externally. It's not going to be an internally routed email. So if you put controls in where you're monitoring things like emails internally versus externally, and, 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 and we've implemented that for many customers, in a, in a normal internal type breach where somebody else in the company is exploiting or, or be, has been compromised and it, and it goes to somebody else, the CEO or the president of the company or whoever, um, those don't get caught. But when you're expecting an external email, it, it's tougher to catch those because uh, it's, it's supposed to be external. So we're seeing that a lot in the supply chain. And to your first point about insurance, there's massive changes coming in the insurance industry. Um, and and I, I feel for the insurance businesses out there um, because in the last several years, uh, their business is a, is a, is a for-profit business. There's no secret to that. They, 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 they collect premiums for car insurance and then they pay out claims for people to get in accidents. And the idea is they collect more money than they pay out. In the ransom and in the cyber security insurance or cyber insurance space, uh, the insurance companies on average have had a 300 to 400% claims loss ratio. Mm -hmm. For every dollar they're collecting, they're paying out three to four dollars. That's not sustainable for a business. So you're seeing a pendulum swing right now in the insurance space. We've seen it with our customers. We, we, we work with the insurance companies. And unfortunately, they have to do it to protect their business. But it's a lot of people are being denied insurance. And the rigor to get insurance is going to be much greater. And it's going to include company supply chains. It's, it's, it's coming. It's going to be, do you know where your data is? Do you know what part of your supply chain has access to that data because of services they, they deliver? We're part of it with the clients that we manage and, and that we do our SOC services for because we have access to, to some of that data. So we become part of that insurance renewal process and we're involved and, and we have to have equal or superior controls. And so that's a big piece and, and, and people in this, this, this forum and, and in this uh, presentation today attending, they're gonna start to see kind of questions coming from their customers that they supply to that we need you to be involved in our insurance renewal. And it won't be, the, the, the days of kind of filling out a form and checking off boxes, I, I think are behind us. There's gonna be a lot more rigor now where, where in the past it was kind of, do you have something? And it was a check mark. And typically it was around technology. And if you think of kind of the triad of technology, people and process, it was really just looking at the technology components. And it was a check mark that says, do you have this technology? There was really no check in the past in, in the insurance space around, do you have the people to run that technology and are they proficient? And do you have the processes to help you kind of combat things that are happening? And how do you audit and check those things? And, and what's your rigor around people process and technology? It was in the past, it was really about just the tech. Do you have a piece of technology? And you're going to start to see, and if, if, if in our, the people attending today may have already seen it, they're going to start to see the more rigor around what is it that uh, that I'm doing, and and I want to show evidence that you've tested uh, your controls, and 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 clearly things like email um, hygiene, email solutions that look for phishing. That's one of the controls the insurance companies are looking for. Uh, awareness is on every check mark boxes. Yep, absolutely, yeah, we see that everywhere. Yep. And data loss prevention. What are you doing to to identify your key data and 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 prevent it from going out the doors. And those three are key check boxes that are all kind of in the realm of business email compromise and, and, and can be controlled through both people, both process and by technology. Yeah, some recent stats, we, we have a, uh, a group that gets together of CISOs that, that consults with us. We've actually got resident CISOs on staff that, that communicate and talk with their peers uh, and, and try to find out, you know, what are you doing on a plan that deals with ransomware or a plan that deals with cyber insurance? And 
some of the feedback they got, it's it's incredible the the lift that's required now with cyber insurance. And in that one said, I've already spent over 40 hours this year answering questions. Another said, I had 20 questions last year for my cyber insurance. I have 200 this year. And it's just taking so much work behind it to, to also maintain the same coverage. Some are lowering the coverage or they're charging more and, and you can't get the same coverage. So it's going to be tough, I think. Um, or, or removing things like ransomware, because we've seen yeah. that a lot now where ransom is not covered by a cyber policy anymore. Right. Um, espionage, uh, denial of service, these things are, but ransom is no longer being covered in some cases. Yeah, because they feel like it's just too easy to crack through, that a business email compromise email is going to just open that door um, and, and let somebody in that'll do bad things and cost a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. these, uh, yeah, the headlines certainly show the money. Um, one thing I was going to share, uh, you know, everybody's always curious sometimes, how does all of this kind of play out or what's the email look like? And we had one, I, I like to show, we've anonymized a bit here, but it was in, a, in the supply chain. And this was, you know, somebody was targeting the manufacturer to get to the distrib distribution company and you get your normal things of an urgent payment. And of course there's specific amounts in there and things like that. But one, one thing that we've seen that's, that's been unusual is the different domain extensions. DR has been a funny one that's been out there for the last couple of months, but that's a domain that they use. Another tactic they'll use is they'll actually add in additional names that are part of that organization like John Smith or Amy White. They had nothing to do with any of this. The bad actor just went out to LinkedIn to grab a few extra names so that whoever received this would think, oh, it's, you know, it's other people are involved. So this is clearly something that's important and is something that I should act on. Uh, this is what we try to train folks on, on all the time is just pay attention. There's those things where you can hover over if there's a URL in there to see, does that link look very unusual that it's not actually going to your supply chain partner's website? Uh, are there odd extensions on the domains like this? Is there a sense of urgency? And then there should always be a plan in place of if money is going to be transferred, you pick up the phone, you talk about it first, you don't just blindly accept it because if you just do the reply to, to test that, that's what the bad actor is looking for as well. Because you can be replying right back to the bad actor thinking you're replying back to, you know, your friend over in, <clears throat> in your supply chain partner. So lots of different things can be happening on the email that you may not catch. Just wanted to raise those. I don't know if you've got anything to add on this. Yeah, I would say, I mean, this, this is where um, awareness training comes in. And, and I, it's a, a pedestal I get on almost every day. Um, and, and you and I are of the advantage where uh, these things are second nature to us because we live in this world. Um, but a lot of this audience on, on this call, I don't imagine lives in this world. And, and I, I always use the example of golf. If you go out and golf once a year, you're probably going to suck at golf. But if you golf every day, you're going to get much better. And it's what's called muscle memory. And the same thing with identifying these types of tactics and, and, and campaigns and fish emails versus not fish emails. It takes that muscle memory. It takes that repeat training uh, by an organization or by a, a third party provider to train people to understand how to identify things like this. Because to many of the people on this call or many of the people that we hear from and you hear from every day who have unfortunately fell victim. This looks very legitimate. This looks like something that should happen. And it's an invoice number that's in our system. It makes sense. And therefore, why wouldn't, uh, why wouldn't I transfer the money here? But, but there are indicators. There, there's kind of little, little breadcrumbs in the process of the email, of the subject line, of the, of the actual body of the email, of the links and all those things that People need to be taught and, and create that muscle memory for how to look out for these things. And, and it, again, it only happens with practice, just like golf. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. And I still try to practice and I'm not that great at golf. But I, you, you hit enough shots that you get out there and you want to just keep going. It brings you back out. But, uh, yeah, I'd say on the training, the last, the last bit I would add to that is 
we believe strongly in not doing the once a year that your 16 year old can sit down and go take it for you, right? It needs to be vignettes. This needs to be, have you engaged, you know, where maybe you're dropping a little, you know, breadcrumb out there once a quarter to people in your organization so that they see that, they get that muscle memory. And it may be really simple that after, even if they say reported as a fish, I think that that is suspicious. Say, hey, great job. Uh, thank you so much. You caught it. You're keeping us safe. You know, awesome job. And if they know it's going to happen randomly, they're going to be on the lookout a bit more versus, hey, it's October, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Guess what? I know my one hour training is coming that I'm obliged to do. And it's the exact same training I've seen for the last three years they're not going to pay as much attention and it's, and it's really not educating them enough. So I think you got to really look at the type of program you put in place. Yeah. And it, and it has to be, uh, as you said, uh, I'm going to say somewhat targeted. We, 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 in our service, when we, when we start with new clients and in, in the aware, awareness space um, is we start off with a simple campaign. We're coming up on Halloween in a few weeks. We put one out that's that from the company on behalf of the company that says, Hey, our Halloween party starting here. Click on this link to sign up to see uh, to see everyone's costume or something very obvious like that, and it goes broad to the whole organization to get a baseline. But then, as we we regress with that client, and as they uh, as they start to get better, we make them more targeted. We to, we target their APAR and, and supply chain uh, customer or not customers, the supply chain or portion of their organization. We target their their different pieces of the organization. We look for information they're publicly making available. And with their acknowledgement, we make campaigns that, that are more sophisticated because it's candidly what the threat actors are going to do. We're doing the same thing, just our intents are not malicious, our intents are trained. And then what comes of that, and, and a lot of organizations, and I'll, I'll switch gears for just a second here, a lot of companies have vulnerability management. And that's a technology that looks at the various different technology components in your environment and says, okay, we need to patch these infrastructure pieces. We need to patch Microsoft because there's these vulnerabilities. And that's a valuable technology and every organization should have it. The equivalent for your people is security awareness, is the awareness training and the awareness testing. And a lot of organizations still aren't doing it. And our survey, our survey provided that and, and showed that that we mm -hmm. ran last month. A lot of organizations are still focusing on the technology where at the end of the day, really your, your, your human capital, your people are your number one vector because um, it's the people that are falling victim, not technology. Yeah. And, yeah. and doing just that once a year, hey, pass this one test, we did a check mark, we actually, uh, we actually have everyone's security awareness trained um, is not effective. And, and you have to do it on an ongoing. And as you said, Dennis, it has to be um, surprised. It has to be unplanned. It can't be expected by the individuals. So you can pick up on things like certain events, Thanksgiving, Halloween, certain seasons, um, all the things, depending on the line of business that the organization is, but you really need to make it more complex. It has to be ongoing. And as you get, uh, as and, and depending on, on whether you're having a third party organization like ourselves do it, whether you're doing it yourself as, a, as an IT organization in, in, in the supply chain, you then have to really take that information and say, okay, we have a vulnerable subset of people here. And these people need additional training. And, and, and back to my golf example, they're hitting 130 is their score. We need to give them more time on the driving range so that they can get their score down to 100 or down to 85 or whatever the goal is. And so that's, that's really the, uh, the, the, the part of that awareness. It can't be a one year or the effect won't be there. Yep. Agreed. And that's a, uh... I think that's one of the things where proof point shines is the, the level of detail that we can provide in this people centric strategy of who's clicking, what are they being targeted with, you know, how are they being targeted so that the CISOs know the types of programs they need to roll out to empower the teams. They, they know better how their organization is being targeted. They can talk to security operations about the kind of controls that need to be in place and they really have their arms wrapped around all the way down to an individual employee to the entire organization of what why are we a target and how are we being targeted so that we can be better prepared for that because it's not all tech it, it is definitely not all tech you got to do more than that 
Uh, and that's why, you know, we, I talked about, we've got this forum with CISOs. We did a study earlier this year. Uh, it wrapped up in Q1 going into Q2 and we had 186 CISOs reply back during 20 and into the Q1 of 2021, we asked them, what were your biggest threats that you're concerned about coming into the new year, coming out of this pandemic and, and what we've got to take care of? And, you know, BEC was top of the charts for everybody. It was just consistent. And one of the things we also saw across the board is they all also said, supply chain is always out there. How do I know if my supply chain is being weaponized against me? I need help there. And I'm always fearful of ransom attacks. And I bet if you do this now, ransom is probably up even higher at this point. Uh, but you can see some of the others, you know, certainly cloud account compromise. We talked about that earlier, the need to know who's got that privileged access and has an account been compromised. Uh, I talked a little bit about insider threat. You know, we bought a company called Observe It to, to say data just doesn't walk out the door. So, you know, we're talking today about what all the CISOs mention as these are my concern of my top risks. And a lot of them go together. They're woven together in how you've trained your people, how you're being targeted. And a lot of these do originate from email fraud to, to get through. What are some of your thoughts on here? Have you seen this? Is this pretty consistent with what you hear from your customers? The same information. If I were to look at the the uh, high number of, of kind of incidents we've been involved in, um, above and beyond the kind of survey of what people believe is kind of their their biggest cybersecurity threats, uh, the reality is these are the biggest threats. And in fact, your first two there, uh, the email and cloud account, they almost go hand in hand because if you get the business email compromise, you effectively get the cloud email cloud compromise as well for most organizations, or vice versa. Um, so those two being one and two are, are effectively the same. And, and, uh, and, and they lead to various different things. As we said, they, they lead to ransomware. It's a big, big area for ransomware once I have privilege. Um, and they lead to other types of uh, fraud. And, and again, man in the middle attacks, these sorts of things. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's the beginning of a multiple different vectors by which threat actors will take advantage of organizations. Yeah, we've we've organized ourselves. I'm sure you would even probably consult with your customers in the same way around, do you have a strategy around threat protection and a strategy around information protection? And that's how we think of the world. So what what is it that we're doing around that threat protection at the email gateway on the inbound or the outbound? What's happening? Who's is there an identity deception there? And then where is that information going? So we got we got to protect that valuable information. And one of the things we've seen, you know, this is part and parcel of this is look at we just talked about this. What is always top of the charts for this awareness and training, right? So you look at best practices of all these agencies in the United States, and we've talked to Canadian Cyber Center, and it's a lot of the same thing. But you've got to have strong training. I talked about DMARC earlier, making sure nobody's spoofing your domains, acting as you to your supply chain. And then you can also do the same on the inbound, honor those that have done that DMARC reporting. But then there are other things you've got to do, other components, uh, including down there at the bottom, who's got privileged account access. Um, any thoughts on some of these? These are, these are kind of best practices that, that are out there. Well, absolutely. And, and, and interestingly, a lot of these align to the questionnaires that people are getting for cyber insurance now. And, and these are the kind of the key, um, I, I like to use the analogy, you gotta be this high to ride the ride. Um, to get a cyber insurance, you gotta, you gotta have these core pieces and then they're all, they're all the check marks. And, and some of them are uh, easier than others. And some of them are, are, are more complicated and take more time and take more specialized skill. Um, but they're all to some degree equally as important with, uh, and I'm glad it's at the top of the list there, uh, your awareness training. Because again, I, 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 I feel very strongly about that as, as organizations. Um, I, I'm not sure are doing enough around that and, and we highly promote that every time. And then having the controls in to kind of watch and prevent. Absolutely, and, that, and you know, that drove an organization like RBC, uh, and this is public knowledge, drove them uh, over two years ago, actually, 
to be a leader in this area to say, I'm going to adopt the best practices, but I'm going to take it a step further. And I'm going to ask my supply chain. If you do business with me as RBC, we need you to safeguard yourselves because these assets are really important. And we need to make sure that when we're engaging with you and sending information back and forth, that it's done in a secure manner. And so pushing their supply chain partners to publish a DMARC record, telling them they need to do TLS, uh, it was, was critical on that, on that you know, overall verification um, that if you don't have some of these basic controls in place, if you don't have some of this reporting in place, you, your supply chain can be weaponized against you. And so you've obviously got to have the visibility but you need to work. I think this is where that messaging team, the CISO team can work with procurement and say, hey, let's start with our top 100 suppliers. We're gonna draft a letter to them because we've done certain things to improve our security posture. And we're gonna ask them to do certain things so that we've got better visibility because if you've got the tools to monitor your supply chain coming in, to understand who's a high risk to you. So, so what we do is we try to decorate a dashboard for our customers based on our over 8,000 gateways globally. So if we see something odd happening to an RBC supply chain partner, we can say, hey, we've seen compromise activity from this partner. That means they could be targeting you at some point. So you need to be aware you've got a partner that's got an issue out there. It could be lookalike domains, could be a variety of different things. So I think when it comes to supply chain, you also have to be proactive down into your supply chain to talk about measures they should be taking so that you're protecting yourself. Uh, have you seen anything like this? Are you seeing more organizations do this kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, we're involved with them with clients uh, that are being asked by their by their major customers. So we're being involved with clients like a supply chain of, of RBC that was, was subject to these uh, to help put in, the, in place those controls, to help them uh, um, to meet the the standard that RBC set, as an example, or other organizations that we uh, we deal with in the financial, retail, and and uh, other spaces in Canada. So we see that a lot. Do you want to? Uh, we've only got about ten more minutes, yep. uh, Dennis. I thought do you want to talk a bit about more some of the the, the variants and BEC variants and things that will uh, that might resonate with this audience. Yeah, uh, let's talk through that. So there are different things that you would see as an organization. Uh, and you brought up one where you saw an M&A fraud occurring. So the five most prevalent gift carding, hey, I'm out of the office. Can you get these gift cards? I want to do that as a reward. Payroll redirect or diversion. I just started, you know, uh, or I've changed my bank account information. The most prevalent supplier invoicing fraud. That's why we talk about supply chain today. Uh, Kevin brought it up, mergers and acquisition fraud. That's in the public domain. Somebody announces they're going to buy somebody. Then bad actor starts creating emails that, uh, that are trying to bite off on that to get you know, critical information. And then ship and redirect. Uh, that's been an interesting one recently where if you have some type of good that could be resold, laptops to toys to something, People might want to redirect that shipment because then they can take that and sell the product somewhere. They can go to a pawn shop or wherever and they start selling the product. But those are the themes around uh, the five most used BEC attack vectors. Is this something similar you're seeing as well? Yeah, and, and as, as you highlighted it, the shipment redirect isn't about an immediate cash reward like the other three. It's about the ability to get uh, a cash or get a, a product for free. And, and the shipment redirect, I would say, is more prevalent um, in the, I'm going to say, consumer space individuals. You'll get it on your Hotmail, Gmail account. Hey, you ordered this from Amazon and, and, uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, the M&A fraud we see uh, largely more so before a public announcement has come out. And this is around, like, as our example, where, where somebody compromised what was happening and, and part of the... Uh, I'm going to say threat was that the information was leaked. Um, and then and then obviously in supply chain or, or in our customers today, the supplier invoicing fraud is is probably the highest one in that area because it's uh, um, it tends to be the highest value as well. I mean, the maximum gift card you can buy is 500 bucks, I think. So it takes a lot of $500 to, to fill these guys' wallets as threat actors, but I redirect one $30,000 invoice and, and that's a good day's work. 
Yeah. Um, yep. That is, so. that's definitely the biggest for sure. And that's, that's that payout, right? That's, that's the whale. Yep. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's where you're going is supplier fraud. And, and <laughs> we, we studied this. This was uh, earlier in the year when we talked to those CISOs, 98% had received a threat from a supplier domain. So it's, it's out there, just like you're going to find a Hortons on the corner. You know, you're going you're gonna to find a supplier threat is going to happen. It happens every industry. You, you can't get away from it, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think the best thing to kind of wrap up on, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, and I'm going to flip it to you, is we see this, as I talked about, in a platform strategy of threat protection, information protection. And if we go back to the original topics with business email compromise, leading to email account compromise, best practices, every organization is going to have some type of a gateway. You're going to want to have something that's got strong machine learning, ability to understand what's different in this email from this partner than what it used to be in the past. Has something changed? Email authentication that I talked about, that goes to that DMARC component. Honor those DMARC records, honor what other organizations have done around authentication and certainly do it yourself. Best practice. And honestly, when we talk about cyber insurance, you're not going to be able to qualify for great cyber insurance if you can't lock down what you own and control. So that helps mitigate the business email compromise attempts on the organization. Now, when something happens, you need to know who's got access to your cloud accounts. So when an email account compromise happens, do you know who's got privileged access? Are they accessing it in different locations? What if you could control the web access in a way that they're in a walled garden? We've got tech around that that organizations are really excited about where imagine they've taken that laptop, they're the company asset home, they're on Facebook or you give them access to be able to watch you know, a hockey game or they're doing their fantasy football and there's malvertising links on these sites. In the same way that we're looking for a malicious attachment or URL that's coming into the organization, clicking on a malicious attachment. What if you could go into a walled garden so you don't have to worry about engaging with a bad actor if that URL that, that is on a Facebook site or elsewhere, so that's safe. So you've got to have that visibility to any type of a compromise. And then of course, remediation. And that's something that we believe in from clicking that button as a user to be able to know who else has received it. Well, what if you could be able to take that and say, I'm gonna remediate everybody that got this malicious email. We're gonna extract it from all the inboxes regardless if they clicked on it or not, because thankfully somebody has reported that or it was weaponized post delivery. So this is a great framework that we use with our customers. And then we layer in the tech underneath these bubbles, but these are really the talking points of, of best practice around mitigating BEC and EAC. Uh, I'll flip it over to you now, Kevin. Yeah, and, and a lot of the misconception, um, and again, depending on the size of, of the organizations that our audience is part of, um, sometimes this is large organizations will implement these technologies, tools, controls, people, and processes internally. Um, sometimes they'll look to a shared services model and have these provided as an outcome. And, and that's available as well. And, and as an example, the remediation one you talked about that, we call that threat hunting. And that's where we take something that's happened as, as kind of patient zero and look across uh, the rest of that organization or even across multiple organizations that we supply and, and, and that we prevent, protect and see if the same thing has happened across them. It's kind of the... Uh, uh, the, the crowd model, the crowdsource model. So uh, definitely these, and, and, and some of these things, as I said, are, are as you, as you con, con, talked about, are, are specific pieces. Some of them can be done just by changing your process. Uh, authentication, again, we talked about kind of some of the business email compromises. Number of, pe number of accounts that people have today, I got an account at Home Depot, I got an account at here, I got an account, I might have a thousand accounts. And remembering, a thousand different passwords is, is unmanageable. Um, and therefore having a thousand unique passwords and remembering all of them is unmanageable as well. So if you, if you don't have the, the business cycle or the budget to do two factor or, or higher end authentication technologies, at least having a password management vault solution on an individual uh, or on the basis of people that have privileged access in the organization can allow you to have different unique passwords for each of your applications that you don't have to remember 
And really all you have to do is make sure that your password vault's secure and remember one and make sure it's complex and make sure you change it. You know, there's a lot of arguments about whether you change password vaults or not. Um, I do, but uh, yeah. make sure it's complicated so that you don't get breached. So then if one of those hundred accounts gets breached, the, the, the would be hackers can't use the spray and pray method and find out where else you can uh, be accessed. So absolutely on, on that. Makes sense. And, and, and look who we put in the middle, the people, right? Your last line of defense. So you can do yep. all this tech, but you've got to have that education right there in the middle. So um, timing wise, let's wrap this thing up. Uh, and we see the identity deception in many forms. Uh, be prepared. You know, your organization's got to have a plan. You know, that's something Kevin and his team are, are great at doing and be able to assist with, with that. And, you know, protection of the brand is, is critical. You know, nobody wants that brand compromise there. You know, there's a lot of great tech out there, but educating your people is, is just so important. Um, and if there's any question about any of this tech, uh, my name is up there with the, you know, with my email address, Kevin, I'll let you close out. You got, we got contact information for you there. What, what are your final thoughts for the folks? Yeah. I mean, these, these are, these are the most important things I would say. Uh, one of the things that we do with a lot of organizations is what's called a tabletop exercise and business email compromise or email account compromise is one of those tabletops that we uh, we often execute with a client. And, and if you do them today, I would recommend you you include BEC um, in your tabletop. It might be BEC that leads to a ransom and therefore you're covering both. Um, but do those tabletop exercises, have an IR plan, have a plan that in the event of an incident, Here's who I call, here's what I do, whether it be internal, whether it be uh, part of the supplies, suppliers or organizations you trust that you work with, uh, but have an IR plan that you know you can go to so that you're not reacting um, in a state of emergency in a panic fashion. You have a document, you have a plan that you can go to and start executing because emotion trumps logic every time. And when you find yourself in that situation where all of a sudden, you're being called to the uh, to, to the fire because of a, an incident. You want to have that plan that you can refer to immediately. Yep, absolutely. Well, excellent. Uh, appreciate everybody's time today. I don't know if there are any questions that have come across. I, I haven't seen anything in the chat yet. I don't know if our session host uh, wants to hop back on to wrap things up uh, and share. Uh, looks like no questions. If, if there are any, feel free. Please do pop any questions out there. Uh, I will go back a slide. You've got our email addresses here. Uh, if you've got any question around technology, process, best practices, um, you know, proof of concepts and, and any of the stuff that we've talked about, uh, be happy to, to work with you um, from either organization here. So uh, I'm going to turn it back to the host team. Well, thank you very much, folks. Um, uh, really insightful information on cyber secu security regarding email. Uh, lots to take away there, great wealth of information. Um, we will continue to pass on any questions that were not addressed or asked during this session to, uh, to both, both Kevin uh, and Dennis here. And thanks again. And uh, I'd like to close up by just reminding our uh, CMP members to please report your uh, CPT credits for the sessions uh, from the conference. And also please, uh, I would encourage everyone to continue to engage with our exhibitors and sponsors. Uh, and lastly, I just want to wish everyone uh, enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the conference lineup. Thanks very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.